Uh, my name is Adam Savitt. I'm happy to welcome you back to the Center for Security Policy for our webinar series. To check out our schedule, go to securefreedom.org and check under the webinar tab. I'll also give you a preview of upcoming events at the end of today's broadcast. Today's program is entitled Putin's Policy Through Different Sets of Eyes, featuring our new senior fellow, Andrei Ilarionov, and moderated by my center colleague, Michael Waller. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box on your GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, and on our website at securefreedom.org. And with that, I'll hand it over to the Center's Senior Analyst for Strategy, Michael Walpa. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for joining us, everybody. It's great to be here with my new colleague, Andre Ilarionov, who is a, who's a, has a real distinguished track record of analysis of geopolitical affairs from Russia, in addition to his economic background. He's a, he's a new senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy after having been uh, and still remains one of the world's top opposition commentators uh, in Russian to President Vladimir Putin, um, who, who he's uh, had served previously in the Kremlin as an economic advisor long ago before breaking with him and coming to America. So he's one of the top opposition people who knows how much of the uh, Russian leadership thinking thinks from the inside. But most of all, he brings us a, a view about Russia that we have not heard in Western countries. And that is his different set of eyes, which is how the, the theoretical thinking and the big picture thinking behind Vladimir Putin and his regime and how it sees Russia and its place in the world. So this is a really important subject for everybody to, to know about to understand what motivates the Kremlin, uh, not just the single man running the Kremlin, but the ideology and the worldview that he's reviving and creating. And what does this mean for the rest of the world? So, so here's Andre, we're going to have about an hour long, 45 minute long discussion about these issues, and then we'll take questions and answers from the audience. So Andre, it's good to have you aboard. Uh, thank you, Mike, for uh, this very kind introduction. And this is a, a very special uh, pleasure and high honor for me to be on the board of the Center for Security Policy and to participate on this uh, very timely uh, and seems to me very useful discussion. Um, since our topic is the uh, views uh, that is shared by uh, Mr. Putin, who is uh, some kind of uh, leader uh, of the current regime in Russia, it is important to understand what he has in his mind. Certainly, we cannot uh, cover all issues uh, that are really important, and especially in the area of domestic policies. Uh, but uh, uh, I see my uh, duty to just to talk uh, a little bit about uh, his views in foreign policy. And especially, uh, I would like to attract attention of our viewers and listeners to a very particular concept that Mr. Putin was able to develop over the last couple of decades in the area of uh, geopolitics. And this concept is called and can be called, and Mr. Putin called it, as historic Russia. This term probably has not been used widely in the West, and it has not been used widely even in Russia itself. But uh, based on uh, analysis, what Mr. Putin uh, is saying and what he's doing looks like that it is very dear for him, this particular concept. Let's talk about this. Uh, what is this uh, concept, uh, historic Russia? When it was the first time when uh, Putin started to talk about this. If uh, I'm not mistaken, the very first time when uh, Putin has used this particular term in public speech was May 9th, year 2019, two, two years ago, uh, during the military parade in Moscow at Red Square, when he uh, spoke to the troops uh, uh, that were parading um, in front of him, and he has used this term historic Russia, which he has used as a synonym for the Soviet Union. It's very interesting because uh, Soviet Union is clearly it's not Russia. Uh, and Putin understands himself that it is not Russia. 
Uh, nevertheless, he used it as a like uh, after comma, so it looked like almost synonym for him. But uh, uh, in trying to understand what he exactly understand under this term, I would like to uh, attract your attention to the article uh, that Mr. Putin himself has written, or at least he signed it, uh, on January 23rd, 2012. It was one of the six so-called electoral or election articles that he has published before the so-called election of Mr. Putin to his third presidential term. The article published in Nizavisime Gazeta uh, on this day uh, was called Russia Nation State. In that article, uh, Mr. Putin discussed a number of issues concerning the internal uh, development uh, of Russia and uh, foreign policy positioning, in which he said, very interesting and very important, that uh, there is a so-called historic Russia, which is different from the Soviet Union. And he tried to put several criteria to define what does it mean historic Russia from his point of view. Why it is necessary? Because the concept of historic Russia was developed heavily in the 90s and in the first decade of the 21st century by a number of Russian neo-imperialists who were uh, some kind of dreaming about restoring uh, either former Russian Empire or former Soviet Union. And depending on author, different author uh, were using, uh, was using different concept of historic Russia and uh, different authors put different borders uh, to their understanding uh, where the borders of historic Russia lie. So that is why it's important uh, in which uh, understanding by Putin of historic Russia differs from other authors and because he is a person who is implementing policies. So uh, Mr. Putin put three criteria uh, for uh, defining historic Russia for territories of historic Russia. First of all, uh, and we're, uh, we're talking, he started this, this is nine years ago. So this has been a long time in the making. Exactly. And why I'm saying so, because since uh, 2012, uh, Mr. Putin not once has references to historic Russia, to big Russia, or to historic state in Russia. So it looks like that uh, for him, uh, most of those terms are interchangeable. And depending on situation, he's using uh, different terms. But seems to me that the most important, the most so-called academic or scientific term for him is historic Russia. And uh, uh, this article is important because in that article, he uh, described what he understands under this term historic Russia. There is at least three important criteria. First of all, uh, it is a territory where people speak Russian. So please don't think about immediately New York, where some people do speak Russian. Okay, so just, it seems to me a majority of people speak Russian, easily understand it, and they communicating and they kind of in the regular uh, parallel with uh, their bodies. So second is uh, the territories where orthodox religion is widespread. A majority of people are orthodox Christians. And third criteria is uh, the territory of the former Russian Empire at the end of 18th century. I'll try to uh, find this uh, 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 citation of him uh, that uh, Putin said that uh, self-determination of the Russian people is multi-ethnic civilization held together by the Russian cultural court. The Russian people are state forming by the fact of the existence of Russia. Great uh, mission of the Russian is to unite and cement this civilization with a language, culture, universal responsiveness, um, uh, such a civilization identity is based on preservation of the Russian cultural dominant, which is carried not only by ethnic Russians, but also by all carriers of such an identity, regardless of nationality. That's a very important, that's a, historic Russia is the country, not only ethnic Russians, 
but anybody of different ethnicities, but who do speak Russian, uh, where majority uh, do belong to the Russian Orthodoxy and the territory that belongs to the Russian Empire at the end of 18th century. So this type of a, an article in Russian political culture for the president to sign an article like this and then later follow it up with a major speech at a, with May 9th is a big military holiday in Russia, right? So, so this, is a, this is a profound policy statement. It's not simply a, an opinion piece that, that a politician might write. This is a, this is a doctrinal you're absolutely, statement. You're absolutely right, because it's a, uh, first of all, it's a political statement, but this is a, not only political statement, it's a promise, because it's election uh, article. So it's a kind of promise what exactly I'm going to do if you elect me as a president. So that is why it is a, a political statement of extremely high importance, because it's making this claim that exactly what I see, uh, my function, my duty, and what I'm going to do. And um, he can use it also as some, because he has been so-called elected as a president. So that is why he could say that, okay, this statement has been endorsed by Russian citizens, by citizens of Russia, because they have elected me as a president. That is why they uh, some kind of impose this duty on me to fulfill this obligation, this promise. So that is why it is so, very important. So he's using it also to seek a public mandate for his vision, to legitimize Correct. when he implements yes. it. Yes, it is not only his some kind of personal view, but this is a personal view has been endorsed by millions of those people who, according to the Central uh, Electoral Commission, voted for him in 2012 or later 2018 and so on. So that is why it is a, a statement of a very great importance. And, and on the other issue, in year 2017, he has produced the so-called formula, and he sets exactly these words. This is a uh, formula for multi-ethnic Russian nation. And he said, for, uh, he mentioned four ingredients of this uh, formula. This is a one language, one religion, one market, it's additional element compared to his article in year 2012, and one prince. He was talking about the historic development, and this is very important, that just for one language, for one religion, it's necessary to have a one prince. And uh, this has been done uh, very intensively in discussion. So we, now we can look, who are those people who speak Russian, who belong to Russian Orthodox religion, and who were in these territories uh, of the former Russian empire at the end of 18th century. I have a special map, and if I can show to our viewers uh, this map uh, that shows the Western borders of the Russian Empire at the end of 18th century. You can see this is a green color of the Russian Empire at the end of 18th century, and this is a red line. This is a Western, uh, Southwestern, a little bit Southern uh, borders of the Russian Empire at the end of the 18th century. You can easily see that uh, uh, this some kind of this territory includes what is now uh, Estonia, not only Russia, it's obviously, but also Estonia, Latvia, almost all Lithuania, all Belarus, a uh, substantial portion of Ukraine, with one exception, we will talk about this later in a uh, part of Moldova, which is called Transnistria, on the left bank of Dniester. So that time, at uh, around uh, 800, the western border of the Russian Empire uh, went from B Baltic Sea uh, along the Neman River, uh, Western Book River, uh, Zbruch River, and Dniester River to the Black Sea. So. Um, and uh, the very fact that Putin has chosen exactly that moment uh, of the Russian history as 800 is not uh, accidental, because uh, for Putin, the most important part 
uh, of his foreign policy, especially of his territorial expansion, are two countries, Belarus and Ukraine, plus uh, Transnistria in Moldova, plus uh, eastern territories of Estonia, the province Idu Virumar, uh, it's a, a region around Narva, uh, where a Russian population uh, comprise 73% of all population, Slavic population about 77% population, and eastern Latvia, uh, Latgale with Daugavpils, where also three quarters of population are Russian and even more uh, of Slavic origin. Uh, so uh, that is why it's not coincidence that he took this particular um, historic uh, fact to some kind of to give his listeners or readers some understanding of what he's looking for, what are his territorial claims. And so, so if, 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 Andre, if I could just jump in for a second here, looking at the map, and then and a lot of Americans are going to think, well, okay, that's sort of. Putin's neighborhood. Why does it matter to us Americans? And of course, if you look at that map, we have we have uh, legal treaty commitments with three of the countries that are east of that red line, and then other interests in that region. So when when Americans are thinking of why is Putin going all the way back to the year 1800 to redraw boundaries, how would that matter to say, American national interests? Okay, this is a new question, but uh, I understand that it's a very important question. So uh, my answer to that uh, would be, first of all, uh, you first you mentioned that the uh, United States has uh, some obligations within NATO uh, for Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania that are members of NATO. And according to the Article 5, there is a kind of mutual obligations of the members of this organization. As for uh, other countries, including Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova, uh, uh, there is a so-called Helsinki Agreement in 1975 that stipulated that all signatories uh, to this agreement uh, re must respect internationally recognized borders. And internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus are so sacrosanct uh, as Russian. Uh, borders. And that is why in the, no, it's not only legal obligation, but it seems to me that in, in the interest of all Europeans and Americans uh, to keep peace uh, in Europe, because violation of these borders uh, can be done uh, with using force, uh, brutal force, as we uh, can see for uh, now for eight consecutive war uh, a year for eight consecutive year, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, in Eastern Ukraine. And we saw in year 2008 war uh, uh, aggression of uh, Kremlin against Georgia. And we also have a conflict, is not solved finally, conflict in Moldova when uh, Transnistria is under semi occupation uh, with the Russian, so, so called Russian peacekeepers. So in the interest of the United States, uh, of uh, Western countries, of European countries, to keep peace, international peace and stability um, in the whole uh, European continent. And we have seen uh, twice in the, la in the previous century that uh, some territorial claims to the neighbors led to the two world wars with uncountable uh, losses and victims and unbelievable destruction of the European continent and other continents as well. And one of the lessons uh, that have been learned from these two world wars, uh, unbelievably uh, bloody uh, world wars, is that the sooner aggressor is being stopped, the lesser the price will be for the whole world and also for the United States. So it's a, one of the very important uh, lessons, and that is why it seems to me that the United States is interested in keeping a peace, certainly in Europe, in the Middle East, in the Far East, everywhere, as well as any other nation, uh, some kind of civilized nation in the world, is interested in keeping peace. And if there is a conflict, if there is a problem exist, so they can be solved by peaceful methods but not with yeah. violence, with not using uh, force. 
So then just to remind viewers also, maybe to throw it out as a point of discussion, you know, he, the Clinton administration had promised, uh, and Joe Biden, when he was a lead member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had promised that the United States would ensure the territorial integrity of Belarus and Ukraine if they surrendered their Soviet inherited nuclear weapons to Russia. And this was a key to persuading Ukraine, especially to give up its nuclear weapons. So, so, so this means that the United States word to, to maintain its international commitments will be worthless because of this commitment that, that Clinton and, and Biden and many Republicans put the US in to ensure the boundaries of those two countries. You're absolutely right. Yes, it was a so-called Budapest Memorandum of 1994 that had been signed by Ukraine, uh, Russia, uh, United Kingdom, United States. And the United States, as well as United Kingdom and Russia and later France also joined this uh, agreement. This memorandum gave assurance to Ukraine to preserve territorial integrity of this country in exchange of uh, Ukraine giving up its nuclear arsenal. And there is a, some calculations how much, first of all, this is a, some kind of legal or uh, kind of international treaty or international statement obligations on the part of uh, United States and United Kingdom and France. But also there is a very clear economic benefit for the United States as well for other countries because uh, some kind of destruction of this nuclear arsenal this you know the country uh that uh, ceased to be to, to be a nuclear power uh led to substantial decline of military expenditures for the united states so that is why it's also yeah. very substantial benefit um and so using that we have we have we have a u.s commitment to ensure the territorial integrity of those two countries while Putin is saying, no, we're not going to pay any attention to it. This is part of historic Russia. Uh, yes, this is a very, uh, very important point because uh, Putin is trying to play a um, game uh, with two hands. So uh, officially he says, OK, there is no war in Ukraine. Uh, at least uh, there is no war in which Russia participates. So it's a kind of internal uh, domestic uh, civil conflict. And Russia is not part of that. At the same time, he repeats and repeats again and again. So uh, now it's probably about 10 times he said publicly uh, uh, something about historic Russia, about historic state, about big Russia. And one of his statements was not 2012, not 2017, not 2019, but this year, May 9th. So it was whatever, kind of not even three weeks ago. Once again, on military parade uh, in, uh, not on military parade, sorry, it was on March 18th uh, this year. So it was how much? It's kind of two, two months ago, right? So, and uh, I would probably just give this citation because it is a very important one because it reflects the type of thinking of Putin. Um, he said that uh, Bolsheviks, which he personally doesn't like much, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, forming the Soviet Union, for some reason, transferred significant territories, geopolitical spaces to the quasi-state formations, which mean that all post-Soviet republics that appeared after the collapse of the Soviet Union in view of Putin are quasi-state formations. And then, Putin continues. No, they're not, not real countries at all. He's denying their existence as a country. Exactly. And this is, once again, this is an uh, official statement uh, that Putin has made on the anniversary of the annexation of Crimea. That is very important when and where he did the statement. And then, continues Putin, having collapsed on their own, having collapsed their party from the inside, Bolsheviks, Having collapsed the Soviet Union, they, Bolsheviks, led to the fact that Russia lost colossal territories and geopolitical spaces. So now he says that Russia lost own territories. So that is why uh, Russian territories lies beyond internationally recognized borders of current Russia. I want to say that we are ready to live in new ge geopolitical conditions. 
We consider our neighbors not just as neighbors close in geography, we regard the peoples of these countries as fraternal peoples. We are ready to lend them a shoulder and an elbow in order to ensure development, move on together, move forward using our competitive opportunities, and there are enough of them. But, and here's the most important point, we will never agree with only one thing, that someone should allow himself to use Russia's generous gifts, generous gifts, to harm the Russian Gen Federation itself. Hope this will be heard. Which means that uh, those colossal losses uh, of Russia uh, due to Bolshevik mistakes now considered uh, uh, by Putin as generous gifts given to those quasi-states. And as long as those quasi-formations, quasi-state formations, are having special relations with Russia, with Putin, it is okay. But if Putin decides that those quasi-state formations are making mistakes in choosing their, whatever, for, for example, geopolitical uh, direction to, to, to kind of, uh, to develop or uh, to join European Union or to join NATO or to join anyone or just it would be decision by Putin himself that is a mistake so those generous gifts should be returned back and this is a official territorial claims made by Putin in official public speech based on his concept of the so-called historic Russia which lost its colossal territories due to Bolshevik's mistakes. So, so the, we, we would understand these statements and he's making statements of intent for imperial expansion that would break apart the whole mutual defense treaty structure in Europe and the transatlantic and so many other parts of the, of the nation state around the world to, to, to deprive these nations of their sovereignty in the name of this one prince and his vision. And no Western leader has commented on this. Yes. Shock. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, well, we're looking at our shocked faces on this. Yeah, but I mean, there, there's like Merkel hasn't, the Chancellor of Germany. I mean, the, uh, the UK hasn't, the French haven't, uh, certainly the United States hasn't. What, what do you make of this and why? Uh, certainly, it's, we can say uh, that's their choice because it's Im absolutely impossible to imagine that uh, embassies of those countries never read Putin's speeches, never translate them in appropriate languages, never report to their capitals what exactly uh, Mr. Putin is saying. Once again, not once, many times. And all this information is available there on the presidential uh, site in Kremlin, uh, this article, election uh, article, is very well known. So all these concepts are very well known, but there is no reaction to it. And you're absolutely right. So so he's proceeding then with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which goes from essentially your hometown, right, St. Petersburg, to uh, uh, avoiding the Baltic republics and avoiding Ukraine, which would collect toll money for, the, for that gas. The pipeline's running under the Baltic Sea straight to Germany. So it's to make Ger Germany and all of Central and Western Europe more dependent than ever on the Kremlin for, for energy while filling the Kremlin with the hard currency that it apparently doesn't have and severely needs. Really, in order to implement this agenda of a neo-imperialist Russian empire. Yes, and uh, here is one more important point. It's not only increasing dependence on jo of Germany or the whole Europe on Russian gas, but this is a very important because these uh, gas now will, not now, within probably a few months, two, three, four months when this uh, Nord Stream will be completed, uh, uh, these gas will go to Europe, not via Ukraine. It will go via Baltic Sea. It means that, and actually the volume of uh, the, the capacity of Nord Stream is 55 billion of cubic meters of gas. Last year, via Ukraine has been transported 55.8 billion uh, of cubic meters, exactly, almost exactly the same amount. 
it means that as soon as Nord Stream will be completed, there is nothing that would prevent uh, Putin from cutting supply of gas via Ukraine and rerouting it via Nord Stream. It means that Ukraine will lose immediately substantial transit fees up to maybe 3 billion uh, US dollars or uh, something close to that to euros. And first of all, it will be substantial decline in revenues for Ukraine. And second, it will be substantial decline in interest on the part of Europe, on the part of Germany, on the part of France in supporting Ukrainian defense or uh, fight against uh, Russia and the kind of fight for territorial integrity of that particular country. So this is a very smart move on the part of Putin. And even more, there is a big surprise why not only Germany is interested in getting this uh, gas, but uh, kind of the whole Western community, including the current US administration, is not interested in stopping this construction of this pipeline that would clearly lead to worsening of geopolitical situation in the in the Europe on the European territory and would put Ukraine in a very difficult position. But I would add to uh, probably to your previous comment uh, concerning the uh, that this concept of historic Russia is not only abstract theoretical model that is just really interesting to discuss. This is a very practical instrument. And we have seen that in year 2014, according to this particular concept, uh, Putin has occupied and annexed Crimean Peninsula with Sevastopol, the Ukrainian territory. After that, he studied the, yeah, after that, he studied the uh, military conflict in the east uh, of Ukraine, and the war continues over there in uh, East Donbass. And uh, still there is a threat that Putin is going to annex this territory and expand the occupied territories on other uh, regions of Ukraine, the so-called Novorossiya, uh, that he claims uh, that belongs to Russia. By the way, on April 4th, year 2008, during the NATO summit in Bucharest, uh, Putin met with uh, George Bush, US president then, and he said that that the uh, according to him ukraine is not a, a real state this is a failed state according to putin and half of ukrainian territory belongs to russia so that is why uh, it's once again this is an official statement at nato summit to the leader of the western world and he never hide it his intentions to kind of to have this so-called territory back according to him so he put territorial claims in official speeches, in communications with Western leaders, and even at NATO summit. So that is why it's not a secret for the Western leaders that it is not only some of statements, not only academic interest, but very practical actions. By the way, in the same year 2008, four months after meeting with George Bush, uh, Putin started his aggression against Georgia and occupied territory of, of South Ossetia and Abkhazia and put their Russian troops, and there is a Russian military basis over there that, that occupied 20% of the Georgian sovereign territory, violating uh, territorial integrity of Georgia. So that is why, once again, it is not only academic exercise, okay, who has some kind of strange ideas about what particular territories belong to who? No, this is a practical instrument, and this is a practical instrument has been used not once. And as we have seen in last April, just months ago, uh, Putin put uh, huge uh, troops, Russian troops, along the Russian-Ukrainian border on the occupied territories in Crimea, threatening Ukraine to lose Ukrainian statehood. It was statements made by a number of Kremlin people. Okay, Ukraine is risking to lose its statehood. It's exactly the, the repetition of the same statements that Putin has made early on about the, okay, these generous gifts given by Russia to the neighboring quasi-state formations. Yeah. Now, 
Okay, so, so all of this, Putin has, has said this, just to recap here, he said this to the faces of American presidents, Democrat and Republican. He said it in, in public forums that, that people know about that are, that, that are not hidden. There's nothing classified about any of this. Yet for now, you're going back to, to 20, 2008, uh, Putin's been saying this publicly to the face of the United States president. And then zero, I mean, not even the U.S. defense strategy has entered this into its calculus. The NATO alliance has not even entered this into its calculus. And if you look at the at, at U.S. defense posture, the way that the, the uh, NATO has been uh, running its, uh, its practice operations does not envision anything like this about its own um, fellow member states being swallowed up um, the, the way this, this historic Russia uh, vision of Putin has been publicly spelled out. Now, we're going to have to take questions from the audience in a, in a few minutes here. What I did want to ask you, what about, you know, Putin's a, a person. He's not going to be around forever. What do you make of a post-Putin um, government in Russia? What type of successor could we expect from him? And what kind of reforms or changes could they be? Uh, this is something that we've been discussing at the Center for Security Policy for many, many years. Uh, we back like when we were discussing dismantling the Soviet Union and how the establishment said that was crazy extremist talk. We we can't talk that way. But now even a group like the Atlantic Council, which has been very soft on these types of issues, has come out with a with a report that's looking at a, a post-Putin type of uh, Russia. What do you make of it? Um. I would say that so far uh, this approach is not quite realistic. I mean, just I'm, I'm talking about these reports uh, that have been produced by Atlantic Council and by some people in Russia. Uh, they are pretty naive. Why? Um, we have our own history, Russian history, and those who studied Russian history understand it very well. Okay, we can ask. For example, it will move ourselves, let's say, one century ago, 100 years ago, and let's say 1921. And we would ask ourselves or any colleagues, okay, what will happen when Vladimir, another Vladimir, okay, just Vladimir Lenin dies? Okay, whether it will be what, liberalization or whatever. Okay, we know what happened after that. Stalin came. Right? And after that, for 30 years, or more, this was one of the tyrannical dictatorships. So Mr. Lenin was not very much better, but okay. So the, but under Stalin, millions of peoples, tens of millions of peoples, both in the former Soviet Union and outside the Soviet Union, perished due to these aggressive policies. It will move from Russia, let's say, to Iran, and let's go back for a couple of decades. And many people would ask, okay, what would ha what will happen when? Ayatollah Khomeini dies. Okay, we know what happens. Ayatollah Khomeini came in, and the it's kind of the type of regime did not change much. So when we are dealing with harsh authoritarian regimes, with totalitarian regimes, we cannot expect as a guarantee that what will happen after that would be definitely better than today we just don't know it might be and in some cases it was slightly better but it may be worse or maybe the same because the main problem is not only mr putin himself but the system political system of hard authoritarian regimes or semi-totalitarian regime that probably did not change or we don't know yet because it depends on many, many factors. For example, um, a few years ago, when uh, uh, Turkmen Bashi, the leader of totalitarian regime in Turkmenistan, suddenly died, and people keep asking what will happen after that, and who will come instead of him. Nobody knew, but all of a sudden, his dentist came instead of him. So people expected probably okay some uh naive people expected maybe prime minister or head of uh, parliament uh some more shrewd people were expecting kgb leader or some kind of uh, minister of interior or the head of the army everybody failed nobody could predict his dentist came instead of him 
and the regime that appears after that was not much better, was exactly the same, and in some ways even worse than before that. So that is why with totalitarian regimes, with hard authoritarian regimes, it is impossible to predict what would happen if the whole system, political system, is not dismantled. So that is why the issue is not only removal of particular person, whether it's Mr. Putin or Mr. Lukashenko in Belarus. That's a very important, no doubt. But it's only first step. The second very important step and the crucial step is dismantling the system, the harsh authoritarian political system or semi-totalitarian system, because without dismantling this system, it is impossible to do anything. And this is a, it means that the whole task of transition from this authoritarian slash totalitarian regime is much harder than anyone is foreseen today and is trying to discuss in any documents. Yeah. Great, great optimistic lesson to be so realistic. I remember that during the Soviet period, you have to dismantle the old Czechist KGB apparatus that's that's keeping this not just the secret police structures but the archives, the very mentality, and the, actually the public support that the security organs had, that was never done. And in fact, the United States never provided any support or encouragement to have that done, let alone the rest of the world. So, so we're, we're all paying the price for it now, and you're saying that any future of Russia depends on doing now what should have been done 30 years ago. You're absolutely right, and just you're absolutely correctly uh, uh, attracting attention to the unfinished business of the previous transition, because 30 years ago, many people thought, OK, uh, the so-called August 91 revolution that brought uh, so-called Democrats, who knows whether they were Democrats or not, Mr. Yeltsin to the power, whatever. And that is business is finished. And it turns out that almost not much, let's put it in this way, not much has been done. Yes, Communist Party has been uh, some kind of removed from power, but KGB and the FSB as inheriting this organization remains to be essentially untouched. And it means that the Russia whole still celebrates the KGB's founding as a holiday, doesn't it? State Security okay. Workers Day. Putin still celebrates the founding of the KGB yeah. on December yeah. 20th. Yes. Yeah, so it's, there's it's, a problem there. Yes, correct. So that is why the whole institutions of totalitarian society should be dismantled, should be replaced with other institutions, and those institutions should be strengthened. And it cannot be; it cannot happen overnight. It cannot happen uh, over even just number of years, because those people are still in the country, and they are not they're not single ones. They are thousands. They are millions of those people in the country. It cannot happen just for a very particular period of time. We, we can see even in the best cases, like uh, in the better cases, for example, Ukraine. Ukraine is a neighboring country, and this is a democratic country. It's not yet as Switzerland or Norway, but it's a democratic country. But we can see how difficult uh, to uproot the former old institutions in Ukraine. We can see how it is difficult to do it in Moldova. We can see how it's difficult to do in such countries like Armenia or Georgia. It's a really very difficult process and it's a long process. We are not talking about Belarus because it's a totalitarian state. We certainly can learn lessons how it has been done in Baltic countries. But we understand that in Baltic countries, totalitarian regimes was only for 40 years or slightly more than 40 years. Okay, let's say put 50 years altogether from uh, 1939, 1940s until 91. Okay, 50 years. Uh, so that is why there were some people who remember what kind of those countries were before 1940s. There is no such people in Russia. Yeah, it wasn't in the political DNA of the Baltic country. Yes. So yeah. that is why there are many. What we're talking about, what we're talking about, you know, anniversaries of uh, of, of things. That, uh, this this month marks the. Uh, 80th anniversary of the last month of the Soviet alliance with Hitler. 
leading up to Operation Barbarossa. Uh, these are the kinds of holidays that Putin wants us all to forget and that the Western countries have been terrible about remembering to, to prevent this kind of thing from happening again. Do you see any parallels between the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Nazi-Soviet Pact of 1939 up through June 21st, 1941, uh, with uh, with Putin and his historic Russia uh, to achieve the goals that he's trying to achieve. Uh, yes and no, uh, because definitely, for example, some parts uh, of uh, Belarus in Ukraine, the that is called Western Belarus in Western Ukraine. Some of those parts were uh, parts of Eastern Poland and they have been occupied by a uh, Red Army in the autumn of 1939 uh, as a result of the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact uh, signed in the presence of Stalin in August uh, 1939. So that is why um, it continues the same uh, historic tradition that, okay, this is a, our territory. Uh, but uh, more important probably at this particular moment, is not only, uh, certainly we, we need to remember that for almost two years, from August 1939 until June 1941, uh, the Soviet Union was a lie of Nazi Germany. And it was not only some kind of this status of a lie, uh, Soviet Union was aggressor. He attacked Poland and divided Poland with Nazi Germany. Uh, it attacked uh, three Baltic states, and uh, annexed it. It attacked Finland, and there was a bloody uh, uh, soviet finnish war. It attacked Romania and annexed uh, territory that is now it's Moldova. So that is why Soviet Union for two years was aggressor and was a lie of Nazi Germany. And we need to remember that in November 1940, uh, Prime Minister of uh, Soviet Union then, uh, Vyacheslav Molotov, traveled to Berlin with order from Stalin to conclude the pact, so-called, to become a member of Berlin Pact. So, and that, if that would happen, so it would lead that uh, Soviet Union would be an enemy to England, France, and later the United States. It would be very different world compared to what we know know, know today. Yeah, sorry, to we became an ally after Hitler attacked. We've got a, Adam's got uh, some questions from our viewers that people would like to ask you. Yes, uh, what's the real state of the Russian economy, and how much longer can it support Putin's adventures? Uh, for last thirteen years, from year two thousand eight, uh, Russian economy is in stagnation. Uh, which means that a Russian economy there is, there is some kind of a little uh, growth and after that uh, reduction in output. But overall, uh, for last 13 years, average annual growth is less than 0.9% per year. So compared to the another stagnation under Brezhnev uh, in the second part of his reign, uh, it is much uh, worse stagnation because under Brezhnev, for eight years, uh, the average annual economic growth of the Soviet Union was 2.3%. Now it is for 13 years, less than 0.9%. So that is why there is some kind of little better situation. For example, right now, it's some kind of some acceleration of economic growth after which there is a reduction uh, in uh, economic output. In terms of consumption, uh, the real living standards of Russian population today is less than it were uh, they were in year 2014 by 10 or 13 percent depending indicator uh, depending on indicators that would use the real consumption of people is less than it was seven or four years seven or eight years ago so uh, there is no serious investment there is no uh, increase in investment there is no prospect and there is no uh, a single economy that would make a forecast that Russian economy would grow at any significant rate anytime soon. Uh, would the Russian people support the dismantling of this authoritarian regime? 
So we cannot discuss it right now because it's unknown, because it's a semi-totalitarian state and people would not express their views, what they would do, uh, what their real views. And that is why actually the sociological uh, surveys and the polls are not completely relevant because sometimes they do produce mistakes even in democratic societies, in the transparent societies, in open societies, but it is much harder to understand what's going on in harsh authoritarian regimes or in totalitarian regimes. So that is why we just cannot say anything for sure. So we've discussed uh, Georgia, Eastern Ukraine. What do you think about uh, force being used to create a land bridge to Kaliningrad, which is the uh, enclave on the Black Sea? I'm sorry, on the Baltic Sea. All right, uh, certainly uh, it is not some kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a, its aim, this goal uh, for Putin exists, but it is not something that he can achieve just tomorrow or day after tomorrow. First of all, uh, he wants to annex Belarus. And many things that we can watch right now, including this downing of the uh, Ryanair plane in Minsk, by many people is interpreted as another step for Putin to isolate uh, another totalitarian uh, regime of Lukashenko and make uh, that regime is more dependable on Putin in order to uh, help him to annex Belarus and after that to think about the bridge to Kaliningrad's enclave. But that will be second turn, not right now. Speaking of which, how likely do you think the recent kidnapping of the Belarusian blogger was a co coordinated action designed by Putin as a test case to gauge NATO and Biden's response? We still don't know m m much of the information on what happened and who exactly participated. So the, on our surface, uh, it was the actions of a uh, Belarusian dictator. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there are reports that some Russians were on the board and they disembarked in Minsk. They did not uh, fly to Vilnius. There was also some kind of uh, plane that was waiting on uh, airport. And after those people disembarked, uh, that plane uh, flew to Moscow. Uh, who were there? What did they uh, over there? It is unknown yet. And we definitely know that uh, Belarusian KGB is working very closely with Russian FSB. So that is why uh, we should expect that there was a, definitely some cooperation between uh, two political police. Uh, but we will probably know more uh, relatively soon. Do you believe Russia is indeed poised to invade the rest of Ukraine? And would the goal be to overthrow the Ukraine government or more limited goals? We don't know for sure, uh, because definitely Putin himself preferred to use so-called hybrid instruments, uh, not open force. And we have seen that in uh, year 2014, year 2015, uh, when it was possible, he was trying to use so-called hybrid uh, resources, some kind of the green little green man or some kind of so-called separatists, so-called tractorists or uh, some other or peasants who all of a sudden uh, had some kind of tanks, artillery uh, and so heavy equipment, military equipment. But in critical moments, uh, Putin uh, did not think a moment and used openly the regular Russian troops as it was in February and March yet, uh, yet 2014, during occupation and annexation of Crimea, during the Battle of Ilovaisk uh, in August yet 2014, during the battle in Dibaltsova in January, February yet 2015, and definitely during the war against Georgia in yet 2008. So that is why we, and it would be a very big mistake not to expect and kind of to close this opportunity and just to to be blind and deaf and to think okay it's impossible to do uh, and putin will never do it uh, it reminds me a uh, visit of Condoleezza rice uh state secretary uh, u.s state secretary to georgia on july 6 year 2008 
when she met uh, President of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili. And Mikhail Saakashvili was asking uh, Condoleezza Rice, please tell me, if Putin attacks me, and uh, Ms. Rice said, okay, don't worry, I know Russians, they will never attack you. And Saakashvili asked again, okay, I do respect your view, I do understand your point, but if Russian tanks will come here, and Ms. Rice once again said, don't worry, I studied Russian, I studied Russians, I know their mentality, they will never attack you. And Saakashvili once again continued, okay, I do respect you, I do respect your study, I do respect you, you, but if, if Russian tax will be rolling to Tbilisi, what should I do? She said, no, no, it will not happen. Exactly one month, one month later, Russian tanks rolling to Tbilisi. So that is why uh, we need to be extremely uh, alerted to everything what is coming from Kremlin and from Mr. Putin. Yes, he prefers to use hybrid methods, but if it is necessary and he, if he decides so, he would not wait a second. He would use a regular forces to move them either to Georgia or to Ukraine or to Belarus or to any other place. Okay, unfortunately, we'll have to end it there. And Mike, if you just have some brief uh, closing remarks and I will do some announcements. Oh, no, thank you so much, Andre, for spending this time with us today. Uh, I was I I had a lot of questions of my own, but you had were laying out such a profound, logical explanation of Putin's vision that we've never heard before. I wanted you to explain that as carefully as as possible. So it was a really fantastic presentation. We'll later on have a transcript and and uh, segmented portions of this webcast posted uh, for everybody to see in in smaller bites. And in text, but I wanted to thank you. I want to say once again how thrilled we are here at the Center for Security Policy to have you on our team. And of course, I want to thank all of our loyal viewers and supporters for being with us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. And just uh, upcoming, we do have a couple weeks uh, break here, but uh, the next webinar will be Wednesday, June 16th. I'm excited to be moderating uh, a Taiwan invasion. How would China do it? featuring our senior fellows, Stephen Bryan and Grant Newsham. And then on June 30th, we have a book event, Islamophobia and the War on Free Speech, featuring author Robert Spencer and moderated by my center colleague, Kyle Scheidler. Uh, we did enjoy having you here today. Remember, the center's thought-provoking uh, events like today's are only possible because of your generous support. If you do enjoy these programs as much as I do, please visit our website, securefreedom.org. Click on the Donate uh, button in the upper right corner where you can make an instant contribution by credit card or get information about other methods of giving. Thanks again to our guest, and we'll see everyone back here on Wednesday the 16th. Thanks very much. Thank you.